This is a Digital Music Trends episode 128, recorded on the 17th of April 2013. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show bringing you the latest news in the music tech space. This week an event specific episode as I attended the event Music Connected here in London organized by the Association of Independent Music. So this week's show consists of a series of interviews uh, with companies like Ministry of Sound, Spotify, Anjuna Beats, Music Ally, Raw Power Management, The Beggars Group, Record of the Day, Consolidated Independent and the Association of Independent Music itself. But before I launch into the Music Connected coverage, uh, a quick mention goes to the news of the week, which we'll discuss in depth in the next episode after having some actual time to play with it. But Twitter Music has finally launched, I installed the app literally a half hour ago, it's an iOS only app or you can use the website, there's no Android version as of yet, and the app works really well, it's, it's beautiful, uh, but it does only have a Spotify, iTunes and audio integration, uh, so at the moment I'm using the Spotify integration myself, uh, it doesn't have any integration with the SoundCloud or Vivo or YouTube, like it was mentioned in some of the rumors in the last couple of weeks but Twitter did mention that it's working on integrating more services into the app so here's to hoping that uh, this will happen very soon. Uh, overall the app works great as I said and I look forward to spending some time with it uh, and seeing whether it's something that I actually go back to day in and day out or whether it's something that I'm gonna spend a few hours with and then forget all about. And now without further ado uh, here's the Music Connected 2013 coverage from DMT. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Lucy Blair, uh, Digital Marketing Manager at Ministry of Sound at Music Connected. So hi Lucy and uh, thanks for coming on, how's it going? Hi Andrea, really well thank you and thank you for having me. Uh, so first of all, you just uh, finished the uh, Digital Marketing Q&A, what? what was the, the lowdown on that and did you enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. It was great. I think it's always a worry when you start a, a panel like that, which is just Q&A for an hour. You know, are we going to have enough questions? Will there be enough to talk about? And actually, that, that wasn't an um, issue at all. Um, we managed to talk on one question for, I think, 25 minutes between the five of us panellists. Um, it was great. It was really exciting. We had a lot of questions about... Um, how best to use your digital marketing budget for online advertising yeah. um, and what what are the best forms of online advertising to make the most out of a small budget. Um, yeah, how you can promote up and coming artists uh, through social networks and websites. Um, what, you know, what channels drive the most traffic to websites. Um, yeah, how to optimize your YouTube channels, um, how to optimize email marketing, uh, you know, and whether that's still important in this age, day and age when yeah. social marketing is kind of, you know, really, taken the number one spot I guess yeah. Um, so yeah it was fantastic a really wide range of questions and it, it was really great to be a part of it and uh, Minister Sound of course is a huge brand you know it's, it's, it's everywhere and of course you have to follow everything that's going on <laughs> but what is the, your single biggest social channel at the moment um, our biggest channel is definitely well, I guess it's between Facebook and YouTube because we have uh, we have two main Facebook pages, but we have uh, several different YouTube channels. Yeah. Um, but Facebook overall is probably our number one. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, you, you know, you talked, to, you were talking in the prep about uh, some of the the stuff that's coming up on Ministry of Sound as well. Mm -hmm. So on the release front, anything exciting that we should be looking forward forward to? Yes, definitely. Um, we're particularly excited about Retro Two. Yeah. Um, his new single Blackout featuring Shaka is coming out on the twelfth of May, and then he'll also have a new album coming out later in 2013 uh, so look out for that one um, and we've also we have a new brand called speaker box which is a joint venture between mr jam and ministry of sound um, it's kind of a bass music label uh, we've got loads of great events coming up over the summer at different festivals including isle of white um, with people like mr jam nero chasing status uh, some great lineups and we'll also be releasing singles um, an artist released it on speaker box with artists like decibel and majestic so look great. out for that Awesome. And uh, uh, looking at the, the evolution of social media for music, uh, mm -hmm. of course, Twitter music is something that is it's really been buzzing this week, and we don't we don't yet know what's what 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 it's going to be yeah. in your fantasy football sort of game of uh, of social media and what what you'd like to see on the service. Mm -hmm. uh, what what do you expect? What, what what would you like to see? Oh, such a good question. Um, well, first of all, I hope they release it soon because I'm getting really annoyed with them. The teasing. You're really, really fed up with that. Yeah, I just want to use it now. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation, obviously. There's been reports that um, the code in the Twitter Music page uh, shows integrations with SoundCloud and Spotify and various different streaming services, uh, which sounds great. Um, I mean... 
Personally, this is slightly veering off the question, but personally, in terms of online mu music services, I think there's a big issue of a lack of interoperability between them. Um, and I think it would actually be better for the music scene and better for artists and labels in general if the music services worked together more closely to cross-promote each other because ultimately it's only going to do the music industry uh, good. Um, but I really hope that it's going to... Um, lead to music, easier music discovery for a start, obviously. Uh, better music creation across Twitter, kind of not just relying on, you know, a hashtag. Um, and I guess ultimately from a marketing and sales point of view it'd be great if you can discover new music um, and then purchase directly within the app as well you know i guess that's the ultimate goal of course and then <laughs> and if you can watch a video on youtube whilst uh, linking up to yeah. com competitors on the streaming s s side and also purchase the track then it's a win for everybody i think so exactly yeah if you're able to to view that content and consume content from all different kinds of music platforms within twitter kind of discover different types of music content um and and have a kind of better curation and, and discovery service and then also have in-app purchasing at the same time that's what I'm really hoping for that's great well uh, check out ministry of sound, uh, ministry of sound .com for more information and thanks a lot Lucy thanks Andrea it's Music Connected 2013 and I'm here with David Emery from uh, uh, Head of Marketing at the Baggers Group so hi, hi David how's it going um, it's going well thank you alright so let's talk about your panel first you know, did, you, did you enjoy that how, how did it go uh, yeah, it was really good. It was good fun. Lots of um, a whole wide range of different questions, which yeah. is always which is always fun. I mean, as it was a Q and A thing, you sort of don't really know what you're going to get. Yeah. But it's you know it was yeah it was it's a good. game. But it's it's good that it's kind of a room full of people that are actually wanting to know very specific things, which I guess was good f for you guys as well on exactly how to allocate budgets, how to decide what to prioritize. So it, it made it for quite a nitty-gritty conversation on specifics, which is, uh, which is nice, well, given that a lot of the time we're speaking generics. So. Well, this is the thing. I mean, I think that's why uh, Darren wanted to do the panel in the way that it, l way that it was, because, you know, it'd be very easy for uh, him to pick a whole bunch of questions uh, or us to do a bunch of presentations yeah. and actually probably not necessarily answer the questions that people wanted answering. Yeah. So, you know, that w the way we did it means that, you know, we can, you know, okay, you want to know how to spend a thousand pounds on online uh, advertising, then we can talk about that yeah. and you'll get a range of different responses and, and you know, that's that's probably potentially a lot more useful for a lot of people out there yeah. than uh, like this is what I did on this campaign, which might not be relevant to a lot of people. Yeah, and there's uh, so many things that we can talk about uh, on, on digital marketing side for, for an independent label. Of course, uh, you guys being like one of the largest examples of, of an independent, but uh, uh, you know, uh, one question that I've been asking today was also talking about uh, Twitter music and, and you know, finally a, a service that uh, uh, hopefully will think about aggregating some of the different, very separate things that are happening online. Is this something that, that you're look, looking forward to? Um, I'm intrigued. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm looking forward to it because I don't know what it is yet. And yeah, that's exactly. the thing. It's like, uh, it's difficult, I suppose, to comment on things that don't exist yet. Like, yeah, the <laughs> potential, like, there's something that you could definitely, like, you know, I see that Twitter is very important for music because a lot of where I get my music recommendations from are from people tweeting about it on Twitter. Yeah. So something that aggregates that together could be very interesting. But then the flip side is it's like, okay, you know, well, that wanting to sound like a, you know, a boring record label, it's like, how is it monetized? How do people get remunerated? All of that sort of thing. You know, I think original, um, when people were first talking about it, it was like, oh, it's going to pull in from SoundCloud. Well, you know that's not really going to work particularly well for a lot of a lot of people but you know now i'm hearing things that it's going to integrate in vivo and itunes and stuff like that it's okay so that's interesting but yeah. well yeah it's it's just we'll kind of interesting but yeah we'll see and we'll it's see also yeah yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and uh, on, a, on a more specific uh, point of view, I know a lot of labels and artists here that are working on a small level are probably looking to hear what are the best platforms to invest in. If you, for example, want to run a small advertising campaign, you have a budget to do that. Uh, so, on, on your point of view, what would be the best recommendation to you know, if you have some money, w where should you spend it? Um, I mean, I think Facebook is a very good place to start because you can target it so well. I mean, if you're talking about if you've got a small budget, then 
you know, the better you can target things, uh, the more you can target things, the better. Yeah. And I think that's going to be, you know, the most important thing because, you know, you don't want to be wasting your money. So Facebook, you can target things incredibly powerfully and, you know, really go like, right, okay, you're, you're people that are this age and this place that, you know, have shown an interest in this thing. You're the most likely set of people that are going to be um, going to be interested in buying this record. And so you can target in that way. Also, um, YouTube pre-rolls are very, very good because you can actually play people music and that's very that's obviously a very powerful thing when you're trying to sell music yeah. and like you can also be very targeted with them as well the only sort of slight um issue as it were with youtube pre-rolls is the creative you need to make essentially a tv advert and that can cost money and that can be um time consuming but yeah. you do it right and it's good and it can be very powerful yeah. those are definitely the kind of the two two starting points and then you know you can go on from there into like things like google adwords and you know other kind of more you know there's a million one different types of ad formats personally i would avoid uh, twitter adverts at this time because i think it's just if you're talking about if you've got a limited yeah. bu budget it's too early to say whether they're actually effective or not like if you've got you know a decent amount of budget to play with i'd definitely you know put it in the mix but yeah. you know it's still quite early days on it's that front quite, it's still and it's still relatively expensive yeah yeah so, yeah no yeah. exactly you can do it on a small budget and uh finally looking at music connected and uh, it's one of i guess it's really the only really just purely digital event on, on a fairly big scale that happens in london th mm. these days i can't think of another really big event that happens in london uh, on the digital front so so you've been having been coming for a few years and mm. how have you seen it evolve uh, in uh, the last few years? yeah no it's, i've been coming a few years now and it's it's always really Really encouraging to see a whole room full of people um, engaged with all of this stuff and you know I think we saw it on the panel that, you know there's they really are engaged that you know a lot of really good questions being asked and yeah. I think it's it's great to see you know the independent sector being so um, in tune with all of this stuff because it is it is very important and I think it's you know kind of you know the smaller the budgets you have the more important the digital gets you know yeah. it's it really is such a bedrock so yeah i think it's it's great and it seems to be going from strength to strength i know tickets sold out pretty quickly yeah. uh, this year round and you know it's it's a really really great event to have on the calendar great awesome well thanks for your time and uh, it's uh, baggersgroup.com right yeah great thank you cool thank you very much <laughs>
Uh, yes, I'm really excited. Uh, we're all signed up to the, the testers. Yeah. Um, waiting to see what it's all about, really. It's a hard to answer until I really know what the platform's going to be. Hopefully, yeah. um, it's just another way of bringing the music that we make to our existing fan base who we know are, are out there on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and also bringing in a new fan base who we're perhaps not already connecting with, who you know like the style of music that we make and haven't yet discovered us. So I'm hoping that it's you know a, a good tool to expand our fan base. And, and essentially, everything we do is about getting people to hear our music. And yeah. that that's... That's it for us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and finally, looking at uh, independent artists that you know maybe looking at to to uh, work with a label like yourselves. You know, how yeah. do you see them uh, taking the first steps in the digital world? Is it on YouTube for the most part? Uh, is it on SoundCloud or Mixcloud? Uh, different platforms. Well, there's kind of two answers to that. The first is if somebody wants to build their own profile before coming to a record label, then obviously Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, they're all really important. Um, but the other thing to remember is that if you come to a label, ultimately what we're looking for is really good music. Yeah. So if somebody comes to us and they've got no social media profile but an excellent set of tracks then that's the most important thing to us yeah. everything we do is about releasing music that we genuinely really love we we don't go off numbers so it really doesn't matter if a million people have watched the track if it's not right for our label and what we do and we don't genuinely like the music then it's not for us but we wish them good luck yeah sure and uh, uh, streaming services you know are you open to all streaming services as, as a label, how do you behave with them? Uh, I know there's companies, for example, like Pulse Locker that are looking at doing a specialized service just on streaming for, mm -hmm. for you know, club and, and dance oriented music. And, and what's your take on, on the, that whole world? Well, it's such a new market that we're essentially watching it with open eyes and yeah. we're, we're learning as we go. So I personally am I'm a big fan of streaming platforms. I, I love things like Spotify. I use it on a personal level and I think they offer excellent um, marketing opportunities to get heard by new fans that perhaps you haven't connected with before um, but you know even within our company we're all split certain platforms we like certain we don't of course. Um, so we're really watching to see where that world goes for us on the whole iTunes is really still our, our general big okay. revenue yeah. maker so that's that's really where our focus is but we're really open to meeting with new platforms and, and we've been in talks with Spotify and our content is on there so you know we're just testing the waters slowly with streaming and, yeah. and seeing how it goes but personally from a social media digital perspective I find it really exciting and yeah I look forward to seeing all the new platforms like Twitter that are kind of unfolding at the moment that's great well thanks so much for your time and have a great day no problem great to meet you I'm here with uh, Alison Wenham, uh, the CEO of uh, AIM, so the Association of Independent Music. Uh, great turnout here today at Music Connected, so uh, how are you finding the event today? It's absolutely great. I mean, you have to come to really feel the buzz and the energy and, and, you know, you have to come every year because every year there's a new surprise, that everything's changing. Yeah. Um, keeping up is one of the big challenges. Of course, especially for for uh, independent labels because the teams are smaller and they have to do so much more than you know than a, a larger organisation, right? So they have to really try and keep up with what, what the latest developments in the digital industry are. Yeah, this is like taking a great big digital bath today, you know, and people are scribbling in there all day long. I mean, it is helpful that we do film it and it'll go on our website next week. Um, but people are scribbling all day long and you couldn't amass this amount of market intelligence and also what works and what doesn't work to, to, to screen out the white noise and go where the big labels go where the successful dance labels you know what are, what's working for them and what's not working for them so you can come away from here with pretty well the next year's business plan yeah, yeah. and uh, of course it's an event that's been running for a, for a few years now so how how's the evolution been of uh, both the, the, the event itself and, and the adoption of, of digital from independence as well. Well, you might not believe this, but when we first started this event, it was for physical distributors. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was about getting labels in the room with distributors because back in the old days, I mean, this is only 13, 12 years ago, um, the big challenge for labels was finding distributors. And then, you know, this whole revolution came along and now the distributors and the aggregators and the consolidators and whatever you want to call them sit in with the labels but the labels are very much more in control of the how-to's you know how to work this how to make it uh, 
how to make it successful and profitable and reach your fan base. So the evolution has been right the way through from physical to digital. And, uh, and uh, well, next year, you know, who knows? Who knows, exactly. And talking about attendance, do you see, like, you know, there's uh, labels from all sizes and shapes, you know, from very large independents to, you know, one, one-man bands. But what's the trend on that, on that front? Do you see a lot more, you know, smaller shops coming in? Yes, I mean, uh, I'd say about three years ago, um, the digital world was working better for some than for others. Certainly catalogue uh, companies were finding it tough going, partly because of the demographic on the internet, not really switching over to digital. But uh, today, I would say that's pretty well all gone. And whatever genre you're in, uh, save for maybe this one or two metal looks like a bit of a problem, um, they're where you know they're, they've just migrated. They've yeah. met in the middle somehow. The audience and the um, the catalogue companies and the, and the you know the traditional companies are finding that there's a much much bigger audience for them now. And we just saw a presentation from Eagle Rock, you know, yeah. which is a big uh, one of the big companies. And Cherry Red is another company that's seen very strong growth in the last year. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time, and uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. So I'm here with uh, David Balfour from Record of the Day and uh, we're Music Connected. I just wanted to check in on your thoughts. Uh, first of all, your thoughts on the panel that, sh- that uh, you, you just moderated on music streaming. Uh, what was your overall thoughts on, on, on that? It was an interesting panel um, because, you know, there's been a million panels about music streaming and they tend to try and cover too many issues, whereas we tried to cover something really quite specific. It was like, how do we work catalogue on streaming services and that? because it was a limited subject actually helped us to really get into it a little bit and look at some of the detail rather than oh our streaming service is paying enough to artists which most panels tend to be and you never get anywhere we were like yeah well so how how do we work on streaming services how do we work our catalog how do we work with playlists how do we work with apps and because the people here are to a large part labels or distributors this was hopefully useful to them to get into some specific detail about ideas for the various different services and it was good because we had a really good cross-section we had spotify and deezer and audio and e-music which of course isn't a streaming service but is a subscription service and napster so yeah a good cross-section good cross-section and, and uh, it was interesting to, to start with uh, what you pointed out which is that indies have really punched above our weight when it comes to their market share on streaming services uh, and uh, do you think you know that the relationship with the uh, with music streaming services is, on, is only going to grow, grow stronger between indies and, and you know the likes of spotify and deezer and and uh, how can that materialize f- as a positive for the indies as well you know it's actually always been pretty good with the streaming services i think spotify being the big player in the market when they got into the music market they realized from the outset that independent content was important that they needed to respect the independent labels because their users would want independent music so it's always been a very positive relationship and they they've worked very closely with merlin the indies rights body so that's set a template that's actually very very positive where we have great relationships we have really good access to the people who work there and they're always trying to help us because they know that our music is important so yeah it's a really good situation actually yeah. Yeah. and of course you know you, you are you have the, the double hat of a journalist and and also working at working at fine tunes and how do you find music connected as an event is, is your first time here and uh, you know what are your reasons for coming back if, if it's not uh, i've been here probably eight or nine times by now and i come here every year it's unique in that the whole uk independent record business in particular is here every year and it's great because actually in the early years I maybe organized a lot of meetings these days I come I know that I'm going to see everyone the panel subjects are always really well thought out aim put a lot of work into that and I know various people are involved so they're good at making sure that this event is not just taking your money but it's actually giving you something useful and it has the two sort of parts where you know you're going to meet lots of people who you want to talk to anyway plus there's some interesting discussions which can actually teach you some new things as well so yeah it's great and it's a one-day event which is nice it's manageable yeah Yeah. that's great thank you so much i'm here with uh, laura kirkpatrick uh, labor relations at spotify so hi laura thanks for joining me you're welcome good to be here 
So uh, your panel has just finished uh, over here, here at Music Connected, and it was an interesting panel with actually a lot of uh, uh, the streaming services, so a lot of your competitors, which was uh, good to see everybody uh, around the same table. So um, yeah, all getting along. And so uh, first of all, you know, uh, how significant is the independent sector for Spotify? I, I know that you've been one of the services that has been most uh, you know, uh, proactive in reaching out to independents. I would absolutely agree with that. I think they are a huge part of the ecosystem for us. Um, and we have very strong relationships with lots of indies and actually some of the most interesting campaigns that we do. Uh, for example, the Nick Cave um, app example that we talked about a little bit in the panel originate from indies. And I think that kind of freedom and that creativity that often um, comes from them and the entrepreneurial energy is, is absolutely vital to the innovation and, and trying new things on the service. Of course. And uh, you were talking about the social aspects of Spotify um, just then as a way to drive exposure for anybody not just you know major acts absolutely. because of the way it works can you just elaborate on that absolutely so I think what the um, social developments within Spotify really mean is that because every user will see a bespoke tailored homepage and experience um, that means that you know it doesn't just have to be the big artists that are the most visible if you are an indie artist that just has a thousand followers that you've worked hard to build up on your profile on spotify by playlisting by driving um fans from other platforms that you may have essentially those fans are more valuable to you than a hundred thousand who aren't interested in what you're doing so yeah. that's really what our platform is um taking into consideration as, as we evolve yeah. uh, and so how do how do you go about setting up a page on spotify um so it's super easy to set up a profile basically all you need to do is create an account you just need an email address to do that um now you don't even need facebook um so once you've done that that basically is is the main part of it you can start playlisting straight away um and you can start um creating playlists that for example describe um a monthly selection of tunes that you're into yeah. um, artists that you like that have a relevance to you and help paint a picture of you as a curator as an artist um, but secondly another way to do it is to start um, creating a rolling playlist as well yeah. um, that could be just one playlist where you drive all of your followers to and that playlist is updated constantly with your latest pics or however you like you can also do themed playlists for example cover versions that you really love sort yeah. of weird and wonderful cover versions that kind of thing or also of course your own your own catalogue as well so rarities sort of you know themes that may run through your catalogue as well so really that's kind of the bulk of it the second stage um, which is something we can help with is verifying that profile yeah. um, really all that does is add an extra layer of functionality to the profile it means that um, your artist page which is where your discography lives in Spotify yeah. which is automatically generated whenever you deliver content to us um, that page is going to be tied together to your profile yeah. so in a marketing perspective what this means is that you can message any followers you've built up on your profile automatically as soon as you publish new music which is a really nice labor saving device and a really clever way to keep your music um, being consumed by your fans and let them know when it's being published oh. Looking at uh, the independent sector is not just new releases, of course, it's also catalogue. And you touched upon uh, briefly uh, uh, upon one, one of the in interesting stats, uh, I think, of the day that also uh, Audio shared. It was uh, similar in the sense that uh, over half, over 60% of, of, of the plays uh, are uh, catalogue plays, uh, so over 18 months old tracks. And that's another aspect of the independent sector that I guess is I really important, the catalogue one, because it's not just about new releases, it's independent labels and entities that have you know thousands and thousands of albums as back catalogue. So how can you increase the exposure of that catalogue? Is it still through the social and, and curation uh, part? I think that's a very important part of it. Um, I think a second part of it is whenever you're doing marketing around a new release or a current release, always be thinking about how a Spotify um, fan, a Spotify user, might be spending more time with your catalogue. So, for example, um, we mentioned a great example from Warner this week, um, Michael Bublé. They've just launched a microsite. Um, and that microsite, the main goal of it is obviously to drive interaction with um, the current single. But they've also um, made a really um, cool creative timeline that calls out various different parts um, in um, in his career so yeah. for example a gig at Madison Square Garden where they can also use our Spotify embeddable player um, to embed music from then as well so what you've got is a kind of quick look at his career with some key moments pulled out and the reminder um, to go and check out his catalogue and keep engaged in that as well as listen to the new music that's great well thanks a lot for your time and have a great rest of the day you're very welcome thank you So I'm here with Eamon Ford at Music Connected 2013 and uh, we've just finished uh, uh, moderating a panel on uh, crowdfunding which is quite the hot subject at the moment. It seems like it's a subject that's covered in almost every digital music conference uh, uh, right now. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the various panels that you've probably seen on this subject, anything that you've 
seen evolving in the way that people talk about it and I hear more and more mentions of Pledge as opposed to Kickstarter as well. Yeah, well Pledge obviously being in the UK it's kind of had that, it's got that head of steam and Kickstarter is obviously live in the UK from the end of last year yeah. anyway. But I think the big thing that kind of came out from the panel was that uh, in a bit like online dating and chat rooms, there, there used, used to be a stigma attached to those kind of 15 years ago before people you knew the, the earth. So if, if people do online dating, now that's fine. And if people go on chat rooms, that's absolutely fine. So for artists to go on pledge, I think that era of the stigma and that we have failed and please give us money, yeah. that's over. So yeah. I, I think people are taking it. And I think that will mean that it will gather a lot more momentum and that it will be taken even more seriously. It will become an even bigger part of the business. So I think that's really good that... Uh, I guess those, unfortunately, maybe some of those artists kind of went through that and they were the ones that stumbled or fell. Yeah. But obviously, people like Ginger Wildheart in the UK and Amanda Palmer, obviously, is a classic example of that. And they've kind of, the, the, the tipping point has happened, I think, for crowdfunding. And it's, it's just seen as another option. And people were, some of the people talking about the, the, pan, uh, the projects that they were working on, it wasn't necessarily the full project to pay for the album or whatever. Yeah. They were coming in at certain parts of the campaign to go, and we need this, we might just need money for the market and distribution. That's all we want. Traditionally, they would have gone to a label for that. They realized that they can go to Pledge or yeah. another uh, crowdfunding model to pay for these things. So it's people are realizing that they can pick up elements of their campaign and crowdfund them. And I think uh, and I don't think the, the stigma, the shame is there, is, is there anymore. Yeah. I think people just see it as it's just another route. It's it's there like an advance or or anything else. It's 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 a part of the business now. Yeah. And we see today, you know, it was completely sold out uh, conference uh, quite quickly as well. So uh, how do you, how do you feel that uh, in terms of polls uh, of the music uh, independent music industry in the UK? Uh, uh, as this is quite a unique event in its in its format. Yeah, well, I think this is this is really good, and uh, obviously it's it, it's a kind of it's a reflection of, of aim to organise this and to have that indie community. And I will have to put up a hand as a bit of disclosure at this point in that I used to work for aim for about t 18 months, a long time ago, right in the in the very early days. But I think the simple fact, two things particularly, if we're in an age of recession and which has hit the music industry yeah. before anywhere else. The fact that attendance was really high and the fact that we had London on lockdown because it was Thatcher's funeral today and uh, and uh, the site is with, uh, within a stone's throw, not that I'm in, endorsing st the throne of stones at Thatcher's funeral, but it was, with, it was very, very close to St Paul. So yeah. public transport was in chaos partly yeah. as a result of that. So like those two kind of factors, the, the fact exactly, that they, yeah. they had this kind of massive sellout event for a one day event I think I think that's really good and I, I guess it's a sign of the strength of the independent community as well and they want they want to while AIM supports the independent labels the independent labels also support AIM so I think that's a really good relationship to have and they've kind of developed it really well yeah, so, yeah that's good. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to, to finish, you know, there's, there's going to be a few more events uh, in the coming month in the UK. So uh, Liverpool Sound City and the Great Escape after that. Uh, yeah. So well, how do you feel like uh, if conferences can keep themselves fresh in terms of panels and to make sure that people that attend keep getting something interesting out of them? Uh, I think kind of more more artists is probably really good because yeah. there, there is the industry is quite guilty of talking about the industry to the industry in industry terms so having artists on there is really good and there were some artists and uh, all on this panel so that they come with a different perspective and and uh, that was the thing that kind of came out of the crowdfunder panel as well is that artists have to have much more of a business sense than they did in the past because there's a lot more expectations off them and the money's a lot tighter so they it doesn't mean that they've sold out to the man and and yeah. and, 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 and buying down before they before the great dollar sign yeah, but exactly. Uh, I think just have an artist because simply because maybe 20 years ago artists didn't really care that much about the business. Yeah. Uh, they just have their managers to deal with all that sort of stuff. But artists really have to know a lot about the business. There's a lot more stuff's transparent as well, and uh, particularly with digital change in the business, the artists have to be at the cutting edge yeah. of that. So I think 
yeah, having more artists there and kind of having music at the core of it. And some people do that and they kind of they build a conference around kind of music events. So you've yeah. got like the Great Escape's got loads of loads of bands on, or South by Southwest has loads of bands on. But I think something like this worked quite well because it was aimed, excuse the pun, specifically at the independent community. So yeah. this was saying this is this is for indie labels rather than this kind of generic thing. And the other refreshing thing is that uh, when I f- first started to go to panels 12, 13 years ago, it was inevitable that somebody would go, oh, the majors, and it was like, it was probably the most tedious thing that everybody would just go, oh, the majors are idiots and they're stupid and they're evil. And uh, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's kind of refreshing to just go, well, that's just a really reductive, backward thing to go. It's not, it's not progressing anybody, and I think just the fact that it's not point scoring anymore, I think everybody... We're just going, we're talking about issues. These aren't issues specific. These You've got the independent community talking about issues, but these aren't issues exclusive to the independents. Yeah, and yeah, I think exactly. that the fact that you, there isn't this indie major dichotomy. Anyway, of course there is in issues like course, consolidation yeah. and access to the market, and that sort of stuff. but particularly digital. Digital's been the great leveller, and the independents can embrace the opportunities of digital just as quickly as the majors can because yeah. the cost base, or the, the entry cost, isn't, isn't as high. So I think, I think we've kind of got rid of that, fortunately, that whole majors are awful and indies are all great. And I think people would rather just get away from that catcalling and focus on the issues. And I think that's, that's a refreshing thing to see at a panel as well, that those cliches have kind of gone, fortunately. Well, that's uh, great. Thanks so much for your time. And I think we're going to join the others at the pub because uh, everybody is uh, gone. So uh, thank you so much. You said my favourite verb. <laughs> thank you very much. So I'm here, Music Connected, with uh, Kieran Fowler, uh, General Manager of uh, Consolidated Ind- Independent, also known as uh, CI, as uh, you can see the logo in the background. And so hi, Kieran, and uh, great to have you on. Uh, so it's a, it's a the, is it second year this that you sponsor the event. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we've been we've been coming to the event for for many years. I think since it started. Right. And so you know, first of all, you know, w- w- very briefly, w- what is CI? Just so people can can get to know what you do. Mm. Um, CI is a digital delivery platform, so we handle delivery of um, content, so products, that's audio, metadata and artwork around um, the digital industry, so to iTunes and Spotify and all those kind of services. Um, Also, uh, we deliver to places like Grace, Note and Shazam, kind of a bit more unusual services too. Sure. And do you have like a a specific... uh focus uh, as a client base uh, on the in- independent sector yeah I mean that you know that hence the name um, but yeah we only deal with uh, independent labels um, we deal with about 1.2 million tracks in total at the moment um, across about 5,000 labels in total um, that some of that is through distributor clients that we have and some of that is direct with labels of course and uh, it's interesting to see uh, like a, such a huge turnout here at music connected so that's that's great for the event uh, but it's also a sign that uh, independent labels are really switching on to the uh, you know to the idea that digital is, is the future for them yeah, even if you know physical for independence has, has still been like a relatively good good market especially on the vinyl side so uh, how, how do you uh, how do you see that progressing and you see a lot of new clients as well coming to you um, yeah, I mean, we've grown very strongly. Um, in 2012, we started the year dealing with about 800,000 tracks and ended the year with about 1.2 million. Um, and yeah, we we have a significant client base um, in the UK, but also um, almost matched uh, in the US. We have a lot of clients over there, um, people like Red Eye and Secretly Canadian and, um, you know, kind of premium indie uh, indies over there um, and we also deal a lot with uh, Australian companies so Liberation and Inertia and um, so yes yeah, business is going very well and I think the key thing about CI is that um, we enable labels or distributors to control what they do so we don't make any decisions about the content that we are dealing with we enable our clients to decide what content goes to what service and what the release dates are and what the pricing is and um, what the territory information is around that and um, all of that stuff so it's about being very flexible and allowing a lot of control 
And finally, in, in the uh, keynote, you know, in the introduction to the event, you spoke about three key uh, things, which are uh, getting the assets, uh, audio assets as 24-bit, uh, 96 kilohertz, uh, making sure that you get digital artwork uh, as, as raw so that you can uh, size it as you wish, and uh, thirdly, to get the metadata right as well uh, on, the, on the track. So do you see a lot of people still struggling with those three basic things? <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, and it's not always their fault, um, especially if you're a distributor. To an extent, you can only work with what your labels give you. Uh, and if you're a label, to an extent, you can only deal with what your artists or, you know, um, uh, what those people give you. So the, I think the key thing is to brief well. Um, so you have to brief the studios working on products <coughs> about the type of audio quality that you want the output to be. You need to brief artwork designers to provide raw artwork files. Um, and you need to care about metadata. I mean, that, the last one is really, really important. And to be honest, <coughs> the independent part of the industry hasn't been too great about that in the past. So we have certain tools and ways of working that really help help labels help themselves, help distributors help themselves, yeah. Um, but yeah, those three key things will future-proof you um, for probably, you know, the next 10 years at least. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time. No problem. Thanks. Okay, we're here at Music Connected and I'm here with uh, Don Jenkins from uh, Raw Power Management. So hi, Don, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Yeah, all good. Nice to be here. Great. So uh, let's talk about Raw Power. And first of all, just uh, tell us briefly what, what you guys do. Okay, well, we're a, a music management company. We look after about 25 acts currently. We operate uh, almost exclusively in the rock music sector, um, managing acts like uh, Bullet from a Valentine, Bring Me the Horizon, uh, Gallows, Young Guns of Mice and Men, While She Sleeps. Uh, I, I can't do the whole list off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, so that, that's what we do, and it's keeping us all busy. That's great, and uh, of course you were here at uh, Music Connected, uh, uh, you know, uh, an event for the independent sector, and uh, the role of manager has changed so much in the, in the last uh, two or three years, uh, both for, I guess, major artists and for, for smaller independent acts. So do you feel like you have to take on a lot more now uh, in, in this new digital age? Well, I think um, the, the manager's role has always been all-encompassing of what the artist is full business. Um, I think uh, maybe increasingly various parts of the business are uh, increasingly being put onto the workload, if you like. Um, that's certainly true of uh, the whole new world of social media, um, updates on uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and all, all of that side of stuff. So that, that, that's increasingly something that, that we're involved in. Um, I think also uh, on online retail and running um, <coughs> merch stores off the artist sites is something that we look after um, uh, extensively, obviously with partners uh, that you do merch deals as you go, but that's, uh, that's another thing we look after. Um, and I think there's probably some other areas of the business which are increasingly looking towards management to uh, step up to the plate. Um, I think, if I'm being dead straight, I think the first one of those is actually A&R. Um, uh, I think with uh, <coughs> with the business going as it does, I think increasingly uh, the the role of the manager is actually one to increasingly source and develop and nurture new new talent. Um, <coughs> and I think that that is uh, something that Raw Power do really really well, uh, and and we've. Uh, uh, operated in that field uh, since since the start of the business and <clears throat> we continue to do so um, and uh, yeah you know going forward e even this year we've uh, um, acquired some great new bands in including uh, Mallory Knox, uh, um, Don Brocco, While She Sleeps, uh, Turbo Wolf so um, yeah you know we, we, we keep on working uh, uh, at that level um, because I think you know for a management company uh, you, you, want the, you want the acts of tomorrow because that way you stay on top of the game. Of course and do you feel that there's a bit of struggle some, at times between the, the label and, and the ma and management and artists uh, by, by default on, on, the, on organizing and managing uh, uh, what is the artist's presence out there when it comes to social media for example or, or you know st stuff like the new Spotify channels and the social presence on there? Uh, it's not really a, a, an issue that's occupied a huge amount of my time, if I'm being on, on, honest with you. I think, um, I think clearly it's important that artists connect with their, with their fan, fan base uh, and, uh, and nur nurture those relationships as they go forward. Um, uh, uh, but to be perfectly frank, you know, um, 
I have to say, we, we work, um, we have very strong partnerships with, with uh, uh, the record labels that, that we're in, involved in uh, and the publishers that we're involved in. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've never really uh, encountered a situation where we've been hugely conflicted over social media presence or, or, or any parts of that. I mean, uh, that, that I think is something that uh, ultimately I think that's actually a common sense world. Um, so uh, it, it's clear that fans and bands are going to want to connect and basically I think everybody who's in that particular chain is just looking to facilitate that as much as they can. And finally talk about crowdfunding. Is this something that uh, you're exploring for some of your acts as uh, one of the possibilities for them to fund the records or, or do other types of, types of activ activities? Well, we've actually uh, already, over the last couple of years, run several uh, crowdfunding campaigns. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think who, who they would be. Um, so we, we've done work with uh, um, Pledge Music on, um, on The Blackout, for instance. Uh, Funeral for a Friend have been involved in that. Um, and we've also done work with Charlie Simpson in, in that area. And we're currently exploring about two or three other artists that we think it might be relevant for. Um, on top of that as well, I think, for me, crowdfunding is a slight misnomer. I think what we're actually talking about is direct-to-consumer sales and uh, uh, just uh, a question of what the product is, what the timing is, and, and how you uh, take that product to market. Um, so, uh, very recently, we did, uh, in fact, use Pledge Music but not as a crowdfunding vehicle, but as an uh, album pre-order campaign around the Bring Me the Horizon release, which was very successful for us. Um, uh, of course, now there's a band signed to a major label, uh, no real need to raise a certain amount of money to be able to make a record or do a certain thing, but um, what, what was interesting about that campaign uh, is the fact that we used the Pledge fa platform to enable us to um, uh, offer... Um, offer a, a selection of exclusive products uh, from the band's website through to um, direct to the consumer uh, which included a whole range of content that was exclusive to those people who were pre-ordering and we actually put an upfront window on that actual campaign so at the time that we launched that campaign it was the only place that you could actually pre-order the Bring Me The Horizon record so it ran prior to the iTunes and the Amazon and the other uh, sales channels. Um, and we thought that was especially relevant for Horizon because obviously they have a, uh, a very large uh, fan base and also huge social media uh, following. So I think uh, doing something online direct to the fans was in that particular case a uh, complete no-brainer and uh, worked very well for us. Great. Well, Arthur, awesome. uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day and thanks for talking to us. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that's it from Music Connected 2013. I really hope you enjoyed the coverage and I would like to thank again the Association of Independent Music for letting me cover uh, the event. Uh, next week, uh, it's all back to normal. I have a great panel of guests lined up, so make sure you subscribe and uh, tune back in. Visit uh, digitalmusictrans.com for more information or follow me on at Digimusictrans. Have a great week and until next time.